Well, no doubt about it, chemistry can be pretty intimidating for a lot of students, myself included. And you know, you walk into the classroom and you see that big periodic table. I don't have one, so I just sketched that. I mean, because let's face it, I'm doing this out of my living room on a homemade chalkboard. Oh yeah, that's it. That's the periodic table that I'm talking about. Well, thankfully in biology, we don't need to be familiar with all the elements on that table. We can cut it down a little bit and we can look for some patterns that make it a fair bit easier to digest and understand what's going on. And that's the topic of this lecture. So here we are, the periodic table, all 118 elements that we know and love. Now instead of this big chart, we could have just made a list. Number one, hydrogen. Number two, helium. And just continued on down until we got to 118. And that's actually kind of how it started out until Mendeleev realized, you know, there's this pattern that keeps repeating periodically. You get it? Periodic table. That's actually why it's called that. And that's why these are arranged in this particular fashion. Now, we're not going to look at all the patterns there, but a couple of key ones. So you're probably familiar with the periodic table at least a little bit. You know that the chemical symbol H stands for hydrogen, and then over here toward the right, C for carbon, N for nitrogen, and so on. We don't need to memorize the entire thing, at least not for our purposes. There are a couple of ones that I'll tell you to watch out for, sodium and potassium. Those chemical symbols don't match the names, but we use them all the time. And then of course, in those boxes, like for boron over here, we have the atomic number. That's the number of protons. That's kind of what gives it its flavor. And then the atomic mass, which is how much that individual atom weighs. The first thing I want to talk about is electronegativity, which is just a big word saying how much an atom wants electrons. Sometimes it's called the affinity for electrons. We'll look at that first. Let's just get rid of that bottom half. In biology, we don't really use any of those things. Most of them are toxins anyway. So let's simplify our periodic table a bit, and we'll cut it down more later. Electronegativity, the amount that an atom wants electrons, increases as you move to the right and as you move up. Which means up here, fluorine is one of the most electronegative, most sort of electron-hungry atoms on the periodic table. We don't count this column on the right. They already have all the electrons they can hold, so we don't worry about them. Let me give you this analogy. You know, a wedding, when the bride throws the bouquet and everybody lines up, the people that don't want anything to do with that bouquet, don't want to catch it and don't want to get married, they stand way in the back. And so that means fluorine is that super eager person, right up front, really desperately hoping to catch that bouquet. And probably elbows out these next group of people that want it. And then these people want it a little bit less, but still quite a bit. You kind of catch the idea. The ones to the upper right want electrons most. And that's going to be important as we talk about different molecules. Whenever you see something with oxygen in it, which you will frequently, you know that oxygen is going to pull electrons toward itself. Let's talk a little bit more about how that electronegativity affects the way that atoms interact with one another. So again, I'm going to actually simplify this periodic table quite a bit because we don't need that bottom half. In fact, we don't need most of those atoms. These are the only elements that really occur in the human body. And quite a few of those are rare. So these are the ones you're going to encounter most frequently. Whew. That feels better, doesn't it? Does that feel manageable? That's mostly the chemistry we're going to deal with. So let's take it from there. Looking at the simplified version and what we know about electronegativity, we know that at this end, those elements will tend to form ions. The elements over on this end will tend to form ions. And these guys in here, not so much. So since 
these elements on the far left, they are not very attached to their electrons. So those electrons are going to be given away, leaving them with a positive charge, which makes them a cation. Chlorine, same is true for fluorine, just not very common, is going to want to pull electrons toward itself, leaving it with a negative charge, making it an anion. Well, there you go. And that means the rest of these guys tend to form covalent bonds instead of ionic bonds. Remember, ionic bonds, you got a positively charged atom, a negatively charged atom, and they're held together by the attraction between those two opposite forces. But these guys are going to tend to share electrons and form covalent bonds instead. Well, we could go a step further and explain why those patterns emerge. So let's spread these out a little bit so we can talk about them. Over here on the left side, we have hydrogen, right? And if we looked at sort of a Bohr diagram of that with this representing the nucleus, just the H and an electron here, there's only one electron. It can be given up, which leaves us with a hydrogen ion with a positive charge. Sodium, kind of the same way. It just has a single electron. It only has one out of potentially eight electrons that that outer shell could hold. And so very often it just gives up that electron and ends up as sodium with a positive charge. And the same would be true for potassium as well. For calcium, there are two electrons in that outer shell and it tends to give those up and end up being calcium with a two plus charge because it's missing those two electrons. What about carbon? Let's switch things up just to remind us that there's really not letters in the middle. There are protons and neutrons. And usually those protons, the black positively charged ones, balance out with the negatively charged electrons. That's why they're taking on these charges. Now carbon is going to tend to share this outer electron with another atom, this one as well, and this one, and this one. And so carbon usually forms four covalent bonds with other atoms. Nitrogen, now when electrons are paired, then they're pretty happy. They tend not to be shared, but nitrogen can form one, two, three covalent bonds with other atoms. Oxygen has a free one here it could share and a free one down here it could share. So we get oxygen with two potential covalent bonds. And then finally, chlorine. We got a pair of electrons here, a pair here, a pair here. They're all pretty happy. Just this one. Boy, if it ju just could complete that full set, maybe it could steal one over from here from sodium travel over and fill up that extra space. Now we have an extra electron and end up with a negatively charged chlorine ion, or more technically chloride ion. Well, that's it. I hope that simplifies the periodic table for you and makes it a little less intimidating. Well, until next time, keep enjoying life, even the chemistry.